Reactions Trail reports, report on covering ISWAP's 18 billion naira terror financing network. A human rights writers association of Nigeria lament President Buhari's lack of effort. All well, this is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anakon. Outrage, anger and disgust were some of the responses to a report by the Intergovernmental Action Group on money laundering in West Africa that the terror group Islamic State's West Africa province ISWAP moved a whooping 18 million or 18 billion naira uh, annual revenue through the Nigerian financial system to fund its activities. Now, the federal government had been criticized for its failure to track the money and the movement of these funds by the terrorist groups, uh, Boko Haram and ISWAP, through the country's financial system. In the same vein, the Human Rights Writers Association of Nigeria had lamented President Muhammad Buhari's government's lack of effort to evolve the needed uh, intelligence gathering infrastructure to track the movements of this cash by terrorists and their masterminds within the country. Well, joining us to break this down is security experts Dixon Osage and public affairs analyst Ambrose Igboke. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Mm. So, um, Ambrose, it's, it's interesting. Let's start from the um, Human Rights Writers um, Association um, and what they had to say about the president's efforts. I'd like to take your mind back to the fact that the UAE government had arrested and prosecuted certain people who had, they had named to be financiers of, of um, terrorism in the country. But in, in Nigeria, we've heard the federal government again and again say, well, they're doing it. Uh, but they were not going to name and shame. Do you think that these people also fall in the category um, of, or rather, uh, do you think that these people are uh, some of the, the reasons why government has been said to have failed in tracking and following the money? Well, first of all, um, terrorism as and banditry and insurgency are the things thriving currently in Nigeria only leads to one pointer. And the pointer is that it's a thriving business. And that is why it has been sustained for a very long time. Um, the, the man Yusuf, uh, who was allegedly the uh, founder of Boko Haram, remember that uh, it, it, since 2009. So what has been happening is that other groups came in from uh, the Middle East, from uh, uh, North Africa, uh, from Libya and other places, and they stormed Nigeria. And what has been happening is that you can see that there's an upsurge in the cases of uh, before. Now it was restricted to the northeast, and they were having issues of uh, uh, you know Banditry. Boko Haram isolated to four local governments. By the time Jonathan was leaving uh, uh, the presidency, they were controlling 17 local governments. Mm -hmm. But all these were restricted to the northeast. <laughs> Gradually, they moved to the northwest, moved to the north central. And then before we could know what is happening, they are everywhere in the country. They are in the south-south, they are in the southeast, they are in the southwest, and they are all over the country. Now, this suggests one fact. That is a thriving business. First of uh, I think we um, had a little problem with um, Ambrose's um, uh, network connection. But let, let, we have Dixon Osade joining us. Dixon, you're, you, you used to be a soldier and you obviously are a security expert. Why do you think it's taken the federal government so long to name and shame or even track the financiers of terrorism in Nigeria? I don't know. If you ask me that question, I don't know. Uh, thank you for having me. You rightly made... Uh are very made it clear in your uh, analysis that uh, the UAE government apprehended serving uh, sponsors of terrorism here in Nigeria, and uh, they were meant to pay uh, the consequence. But here, uh, I don't know the reason why uh, our government have failed to name and shame uh, these criminal elements here uh, in Nigeria. Uh, terrorism has been striving, just like uh, Ambrose said, you know, it's as if it has become a, a good business uh, here in Nigeria. But for me, I, I will hold the uh, Nigerian intelligence uh, network uh, uh, accountable uh, because uh, we cannot have an effective intelligence uh, mechanism in Nigeria and we still have this criminal and uh, this sponsor of, uh, sponsors of terrorism 
excelling within the confines of our country. It's a failure on intelligence uh, from the directorate of military intelligence and other intelligence network that are supposed to uh, stage a sting operation against uh, these uh, conflict entrepreneurs uh, that are benefiting for the uh, security situation uh, in Nigeria, you know. So what I would advise the federal government to do is to start naming and shaming those that uh, they've arrested. I think some few weeks back, we were made to understand that uh, over 400 uh, people were arrested uh, within the Burundi change. And uh, what's happening within those arrests? Are they finding their way out or are they being bailed or released? If we don't create an effective punishment network or punishment mechanism, Mary Ann, I tell you for free, uh, people will just feel that it's okay to come to Nigeria, sponsor terrorism, sponsor insurgency, make more money, and the government are not capable already uh, to bring you to book. I want to make reference to the Turkish um, um, leader who was in Nigeria recently, uh, Tayyip Erdogan, and he also pointed to certain people, certain elements in the country, um, to having been those who were behind, you know, the... Um, attempt to topple his government, saying that these people are terrorists and they were being harbored in the country. I'd also like to take your mind back to some guns that and some catch of weapons that were uh, intercepted. First, um, well, the first set of them, I think, were intercepted at um, the, um, I think, <coughs> the port, and then another was intercepted in the middle of town. And most, most of these catches were traced back to Turkey. That's one. Again, how does the government deal with this issue if somebody like former President Goodluck Jonathan had said that sponsors of Boko Haram are even in his cabinet? How do you blame security agencies for not being able to um, get the right intel if these things are politically sponsored, according to what the former president has said? And even this government has also made uh, you know, a, a remark such as that, that there might even be sponsors of Boko Haram in government. So... How do you? How does government fight itself? Do you? Can you really single-handedly blame the security um, intelligence network, as you said? Uh, thank you very much, Maria. And that's a very intelligent question. And that's why we need to start looking at uh, uh, people-centric protection because what we have presently in Nigeria is regime protection. Uh, most of the police leaders, army leaders, are all about protecting the regime. They are not uh, people-centric. They are regime-centric. Uh, people centric in the sense that uh, they are supposed to uphold the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, you know, protecting lives and property. But each time uh, an incident transpired, uh, our political, our security leaders, first of all, we want to protect the regime. If we start looking at protecting the people first, I think uh, some people in government will be arrested, uh, perhaps uh, if the security agents are ready to take the ball uh, by the horn, because uh, security uh, is defeated if our, political, uh, our politicians and uh, security leaders are looking at regime protection. We must take a departure from regime protection, Mary Ann, because each time we look at regime protection, we are not going to get a uh, hold of people who are creating unrest in this great uh, nation. Regime protection must be eliminated. If the president of Nigeria has hands in sponsoring uh, terrorism, whatever the case may be, there are processes to follow uh, in impeaching, uh, impeaching the president from government, uh, from, from power, or the, any governor that has been suspected of sponsoring terrorism. The impeachment capability here in Nigeria has been deflected so hard that we don't have the capacity and capability and political will uh, to impeach any governor or any president or anyone that is fighting against the Nigerian state. So I will tell you for free that uh, I'm going to hold the security agency responsible because when you go and when you look into uh, the global network, every nation that is excelling today, Mary Ann, the Americans, the United Kingdom, the Russia, the Germany, check it very well, uh, the security agents are more of people-centric and not region-centric. So if we start looking at uh, people-centric protection, people-centric security, and not regime-centric, I tell you, uh, most guys that sponsor terrorism and hide uh, under the guise of government will be fetched out because uh, our police, our soldiers, our military needs to start looking at people-centric protection. Ambrose, I'm coming back to you. Apologies for the network, um, the disconnection. He's talking about people-centric policing or uh, making sure that, you know, um, whatever is done is done in the interest of the people. But that is in a society where the laws work, the systems work. Now, we're bringing it back to Nigeria, where our systems or the people, um, the politicians, the elites, seem to be bigger than the institutions. So we have 
bigger men and women, stronger men and women, and, and weaker institutions. So how do we even get that? Where do we start from in dealing with that? Again, I want to take you to Kaduna State and Zamfara State, states that have been some form of a theater for both banditry and Boko Haram. These governors have strived years, I mean, over the years to deal with these issues. Some of them um, might be homegrown. Some of them, of course, have um, been as a result of the fact that these networks have spread. But we also have a plateau state, if I'm not mistaken, um, where the governor has been, uh, I think it's Benue State, where the governor has been calling on the federal government day in, day out. In fact, it has become a, a, a him versus the federal government issue in dealing with the issue of, you know, banditry and the killings, uh, terrorism in general. Um, do you think that maybe these states have not necessarily done all that they need to do and that's why we're where we are? And again, should the federal government be the ones tracing these monies and financiers of these um, terrorism activities in those states? I'm not saying federal government can, but should that not be the job of state governors? Well, first of all, the federal government has what we call the legitimate instrument of terror. The constitution has given it to the federal government. The federal government is in charge of the police. The federal government is in charge of the DMI, the NIA, the Navy, the Army, the police. They are in charge of the custom, the officers of the correctional centers. So the civil defense. So all the apparatus of the security are under the exclusive list under the federal government. But our constitution, cheekily, in a very cheeky manner, says that the chief security officer of a state is the governor. But the governor does, the commissioner of police does not receive instruction from the governor. The GOCs or head of your GOC or command brigades do not receive instructions. The director of SSS or directors of other military agencies or paramilitary agencies do not receive instruction from the governor. So the governor is helpless in most of the time. You know, he can only do with local vigilantes and some other things he can, you know, cook up in his state. And we have seen issues where there are security meetings where governors give instructions and nothing is done about it. One is in Enugu State here in 2016, mm -hmm. where there was a security meeting held on a Sunday about an impending attack on Nimbo in the Uzuwani, local government area. And then the next day, as early as 5 a.m., uh, 4 a.m., they struck. Meanwhile, there was a security meeting held. So there are like, uh, issues like that that are bound. Then when it comes to the uh, owners of the financial institutions, the financial institutions are regulated by the federal government. Mm -hmm. The Central Bank of Nigeria regulates the banks, the commercial banks, and all the merchant banks, and all the banks that are operational. So also, we, the instruments for uh, the road exchange is also regulated by the, by the federal government. Mm. The stock exchange is operated by the federal government. The airways, the, air, uh, the airways of Nigeria is regulated by the federal but government. I, I'm sorry, Ambrose, so let me come in the, there. I'm sorry, I, I do not want to, you know, cut off your th train of thoughts, but quickly... As much as we all know that, you know, we're running some form of unitary system and these people all get their, you know, um, um, orders from the center, every single police officer, soldier, um, naval officer, Air Force officer, even the guys that you talked about that work in government parastatals or ministries, departments and agencies, have sworn an oath to defend the people of Nigeria. And the people of Nigeria are not only in Abuja. So it means that whether a governor gives you an order or not, should these people not have the interest of, or the safety of the people in the areas that they've been assigned to, um, should that not be a priority instead of waiting for a governor to give an order? Well, 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 first of all, when you have a unitary system like that, the police, you cannot police the nation with a unitary system where one man sits in Abuja and answers the inspector general of police. And then we have a commissioner sitting in the state's capital, running states. A state like Cardona State, somebody sitting in Cardona wants to run that kind of landmass. So what we are saying, first of all, the structure is defective. The administrative structure is defective and is expecting the, the, the war of terrorism. A terrorism like this and insurgency has to be a community-based effort because it is only the community people can know where to fish out those people. And that is why... In countries like where uh, Dixon has mentioned, like the, the, the Europe and America, you see that 
their security dovetails into the grassroots, the counties, the wards. They have the civil police in the communities. And these are people that do the real fighting. The federal police, like the FBI and CIE, they are not into uh, most of it. They do more of intelligence gathering. While the people that do the real dirty jobs are the people in the, in the, best, uh, in the communities. And that is what Nigeria should have done. But, you know, as we continue going, everybody is like, somebody in Abuja wants to hold the power, and wants to control the power. And the governors are not even looking at that because they go with an entourage of security people. Then secondly, when you talk of the financial institutions, uh, last time the CPN came hard on the Bitcoin operators saying that they use Bitcoins to uh, run some Ill illegal things. We were thinking that, okay, it was, is it part of terrorism? They, they don't have a link to insurgency or something. But again, we now found out that the people, that these insurgents or these terrorists that demand for a ransom don't collect ransom in Bitcoins. They collect this ransom in cash. Where do they send the cash to? How do they pay the money? Some of them even follow the victims to, uh, to automated uh, uh, teller machines, ATM, to withdraw money. Some of them collect transfers. How do they now get the money out? Therefore, there is something wrong with our financial institutions. There's something wrong with the banks where you cannot... Meanwhile, you and I, who are responsible citizens, we will go to the bank. I want to do a transaction beyond one billion naira. We are told that they will report us to EFCC, report us to this, this and that, so that they can be sure that we are cleared. So some people are moving 18 billion naira inside our uh, financial services and our sector, and yes, somebody is keeping a, a blind eye to it. So it all goes to say that there is something we are not doing well. And if we do not wake up now to tackle this menace, because when your country is now seen as a way to have a slush fund for illegal activities, look at the issue. These things are interconnected. Look at the issue of, uh, of drug, of uh, this uh, meth going on and all the drugs coming into Nigeria our youth are suffering from. These are connections to all these illegal slush funds coming in, where they can come into Nigeria, launder money to terrorism, through banditry, through uh, insurgency, through drugs, and then move it out from our system. This is the only country where you are not questioned how you raise your money. Somebody who was poor yesterday can wake up tomorrow and build uh, a fantastic structure, that build a, a supermarket or a plaza, and then it goes to church and gives. Oh my goodness, I think that um, we, we lost that connection with Ambrose again. Um, let me come back to you, Osage. Interesting points that he has raised. He actually quickly got into the questions that I was going to ask you. But isn't it interesting that a president, Muhammad Buhari, who is the head of ECOWAS, um, does not or did not even realize what's happening within his own domain? He took an ECOWAS to uncover this financial um, you know, um, transfers or misconducts with, within our banking system and, of course, um, these terrorists. Now, he's also made mention of the fact that we're a corrupt system. I'd like to um, take your mind back to the fact that Twitter was shut down because the federal government did say that Twitter was being used to co cause some form of, um, you know, uprising in the country. As we speak, we hear that they're going to try to uh, block all streaming flat uh, platforms or um, regulate it. Let's not forget that WhatsApp and Facebook is also part of the... Um, next process that they are saying that they're going to look into. Um, just as Ambrose said, they've also at some point, you know, blocked the Bitcoin usage. All of these avenues are avenues in which legit businesses are being done. But then in a bank, if I go there, I, I'm, I'm just a journalist and I, I do a, a transaction that's over a million naira, it's flagged. But how do these monies go through these same banking systems? And now it took an echo us to find it. How do we deal with the corruption in our financing system? Well, thank you, Mary Ann. Uh, such an interesting uh, uh, question. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, terrorism financing, uh, I think uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria uh, should up their game because uh, if they don't up their game, that tells you there's compromise. Does the, that, the does, does the central bank have a game in the first place that they're supposed to up? I'm just curious. Well, yes, they should. During the NSAS of 2020 last year, they came up with some list of people that sponsored the NSAS. So if the central bank of Nigeria can come up with some list of sponsors uh, at the NSAS uh, uh, rally uh, 2020, then they have the capability and ability to also fetch out sponsors of terrorism. Uh, because we must be very clear, before you can sponsor 
uh, terrorism uh, through the bank, there are three processes to follow. First four process is placements, uh, the second process is layering, and the third process is integration. You place the money first to the bank. At this time, the bank uh, management officials receive the money. Then layering, the money goes through layering, whether you are transferring it to somebody or you are using it for certain payments. Then from layering, it goes to integration. So from these three process, if the banking system cannot identify a threat uh, <laughs> or someone trying to sponsor terrorism, I tell you the truth, there is uh, a compromise uh, out here to play. Uh, because uh, terrorism financing is a very, very serious business. And uh, we must also start looking at Burundi change as well. Uh, what are the regulations? What are the regulators uh, regulating uh, our Burundi change? Because that is one of the uh, weak points in Nigeria. Mary Ann, you talked about the uh, federal government trying to, you know, stop uh, some people trying to stream or uh, streaming or Twitter, whatever the case may be. It's so sad and regrettable that we have a government or a regime that are not interested in uh, policing the people, protecting the people, rather they are attacking uh, the problem. You know, there are two ways to problem solving. If you don't solve the problem, there's not the problem. You don't fight the problem, you solve the problem. How do you solve the problem? It's through operational design. It's not all about uh, attacking uh, the problem. You need to, we need to start looking at solving the problem. The people of Nigeria are they the problem of, of, the, of, this, of, of this government. Why are they more, much more interested in uh, Twitter? Why are they much more interested in YouTube? They are not even looking at threat assessment. That tells you that the National Security Advisor of Nigeria should resign because if he knows what he's supposed to do, he should be able to carry out a threat assessment of this country and push it to the presidency because there are priorities of threats. Okay. Twitter, YouTube is never the threat of Nigeria. Terrorism is the biggest threat now in Nigeria. So let us treat it. All right. Quickly, um, in, in one sentence, um, um, Ambrose, do you see the government acting on this particular report that has been re released by ECOWAS? Or is it just going to gather a lot of uh, momentum for a few weeks and then, then it would die a natural death? Yes, the government will act. Let me tell you how they will act. The Minister for Information will call a press conference and debunk the reports as uh, appetite or as neocolonialism or as people who are trying to denigrate the hard work the government is doing. They will take the report with a pinch of salt. They will see it as a direct attack because this government has seen that anything that is that you are not talking about in favor of them is seen as an attack. And that is why I say that some people around the government, the president, are not, are not uh, doing him in any good. They are making the president look bad. The mm -hmm. president is trying his own efforts, but I think he's being misadvised by some people because they are making it look as if once you are not in agreement with some certain policies or statements of government, then you are an enemy. Wow. We all hold this country together, and we want it to succeed. We want our president to succeed. So when those around him are sometimes being psychopathic and telling him the, the, the things that are not true, it's all behoves on the rest of the citizens to say the... So when we say things that are contrary okay. or things that are factual, they should not be construed as things that are against the government. Well, I'm but I don't see the government acting. All right. Well, Ambrose uh, Igboke and um, of Saje, Dixon of Saje, thank you so much for speaking with us. We appreciate your thoughts. We're really hoping that the government does something about this report. Thank you, Mary Ann. All right. Thank you very much for having us. Well, thank you all for staying with us. And that is the abridged version of Plus Politics on Plus TV Africa. I am Mary Ann Nicole. Follow us on YouTube at Plus TV Africa and Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. Do have a good night.